Our text this morning is uh, the dialogue between the butler and baker and Joseph. They said to him, we've each had a dream and there's no interpreter of it. So Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God. Tell them to me, please. So last week we heard how Joseph, how the Joseph story tells us about paying attention and about noticing what's going on with us and around us as we introduce the story of Joseph and his brothers and him being sold into Egypt. Today, our topic is about interpreting these things. The same events that we notice can seem different depending on the interpretation. In this story, the butler and the baker are looking for someone to explain their dreams. And Joseph said, interpretations belong to God. And this insight is what makes all the difference. And the same is true in our own lives. The question today is, how do you get interpretations from God? And this is our topic as we continue with Joseph's story. This is the second of a five-week series about resilience. Resilience, as we heard last week, is about adapting well in the face of adversity. And Joseph's story is an ideal illustration because he faced one situation after another that was harshly unfair, and yet he adapted well and his story ended happily. So he was loved by his father, but hated by his brothers and sold into slavery at age 17. He made the best of the situation, however, and he was soon head of the household of Potiphar, an Egyptian official. But then he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and thrown into prison. He made the best of this situation too, and he was placed in charge of everyone in the prison house. And that is where we join our story today as he tells Pharaoh's butler and baker about their dreams. Now, although the story is about Joseph, the side narrative in today's portion is about the fate of these two servants. In the internal sense, though, the subject hasn't changed. The story is still about Joseph, or rather, it's still about what Joseph stands for, which is the inner part of us, the part that's open to the Lord, the part that is trying to live a spiritual life. And the meaning of this story could not be more relevant to us at this time, at, or, nor could it be more important in our quest for resilience. The interesting or or maybe surprising message is that what happens in this story to the butler and baker is what needs to happen with us if we wish to be resilient instead of brittle in the face of challenges. The butler and the baker in our lives can be suspect and problematic. The butler, in this story, is the way that our senses serve us by bringing us knowledge, or by bringing us information. The baker is the way that our senses serve us by inspiring feelings or or emotions connected with that information. Both of these are important. Everything we do involves the things we know and our feelings about these things that we know. So in the story, the butler and the baker have sinned against the king and they're in prison. Last week's story focused on being mindful, being aware of what's going on in our spiritual life. The butler and baker are in prison as a result of that very awareness. In this case, our realization that information carried by the senses can be misleading. 
and that the emotions connected with that information can move us in directions that are neither good nor useful. This needs to be fixed. We need to look beyond the appearances to see the real truth. And we need to avoid being carried away by the emotions, triggered by things that we see and things that we hear. And the dreams describe the way we can do this. The key thing, though, is what Joseph says to them from the start. Interpretations belong to God. That is, the Lord's teachings and the Lord's presence need to govern both the information that we receive and the emotions that it stirs. If we allow the Lord to govern these two things in us, we will be able to interpret life in ways that are positive and useful, and it will help us to be resilient, whatever happens to us. The dreams describe the process. So, in the butler's dream, he sees a budding vine. The vine stands for a new understanding, and the ripening grapes that he then sees stand for the truths in our mind being joined to heavenly loves. Pressing them into Pharaoh's cup means expressing this love in words and deeds. And then giving this cup to Pharaoh means making these thoughts and actions our own. The meaning of the butler's dream, therefore, is that as we regenerate, a rebirth occurs in our minds. Whereas we previously have been misled or confused by much of the information that we encounter, we become better able to interpret what we see and hear. The facts then serve our spiritual life instead of the opposite, and we can distinguish truth and misinformation more accurately. We become better able to adapt in the face of adversity. The baker's dream describes this same process in our emotional life, how order is restored to the feelings that are connected with what we encounter. So in his dream, there are three baskets on his head. The three baskets are three levels of the mind. The baked goods in the top basket are the loves that flow into our minds from heaven to serve our spiritual life. The problem is that the baskets have holes in them. So they're unable to hold, to define, or to limit this love. So we have three baskets, and the love comes down from heaven. When it encounters the first basket, it goes right through. When it encounters the second basket, it goes right through. So all the love ends up in the lowest basket. To have holes in the basket means to lack the affection for both good and truth. So the truth is missing that would catch, hold, and shape the love. So what that means is that in this case, our interest in what's right and true is just not sufficient to restrain and direct these desires so that they serve spiritual things. Birds then eat the baked goods because when our sensual desires are unrestrained, then they are vulnerable to the, the false ideas that originate in evil, which is meant by the birds. So our thinking is then guided by these incorrect ideas and our emotions are in charge of our life. Now, the outcome for the baker is very different than for the butler. You would think that the solution would be the same for both. The butler is restored to his place because the things that we know can be redirected and reinterpreted. New facts can be identified 
and our understanding matures and grows and it can serve us faithfully. But for some reason, our natural desires don't have that same capacity. According to the explanation of this in the writings, the baker has to be rejected and replaced by a different baker because our physical desires do not gradually change and improve the way that our ideas do. Now, our subjective experience is that our desires do change, but that's not actually what's happening. Instead, we let them go and they're replaced by better ones. So the butler is returned to his position, but the baker is not. Our fallacious ideas are changed over time and conserve in our regeneration, not so our sensual desires. Now the implications of the story in our search for resilience are enormous. When we realize that interpretations belong to God, we prioritize what comes from him and reject the things that do not. And this happens in two ways. One is our search for information. We look for information that comes from the Lord. The other is that we allow our, our uh, desires and our emotions to be guided by him and not just by ourselves. So then the holes in the baskets are closed so that the love that flows in from him is received and held and not, devout, not be devoured by the birds of false ideas. So information, I interpretations belong to God when we're careful about what we believe, when we rely on him as the source of our most important information. That is, when it comes to spiritual truths, we need to believe what comes from the word and to work to understand it correctly. Now, we're not all scholars, but we can be careful about finding sources that we trust. When it comes to natural truths, there are also trustworthy sources of reliable information, and we can find it if we try. More important than this, though, is the development of baskets that do not have holes in them. Our natural feelings and emotions cannot be in charge. They need to be closed off. They need to be defined. They need to be guided by what we know is good and right. The holes are closed when we have principles of behavior, principles of thought that are from the word when we avoid hatred, revenge, selfishness, prejudice, immorality, and other negative motivations. When we avoid those things, we close the holes and the love can be held in the top baskets. So our baskets then hold the love that comes from heaven and we have peace in our lives. The alternative is a life that's not peaceful as was described in our lessons, when events seem to bring a flood of negative thoughts, we read, it seems like a deluge. Caught in this deluge, they're annoyed, they're angry, they have unpeaceful thoughts, they have wildly evil desires. But when a person is kept within the sphere emanating from the life they've received through regeneration from the Lord, they're completely outside that deluge. They are, so to speak, in a calm and sunny, cheerful and happy place, and so are far removed from annoyance, anger, unpeacefulness, evil desires, and the like. Now, when life treats us unfairly, as happened to Joseph, this might seem like an impossible mindset. And I, everyone deals with negative emotions in hard times, no one expects us to be completely free of them. But understanding this principle can help us to maintain our equilibrium and to be resilient. Now, on a day-to-day -day basis, perhaps the more common use of this lesson of the butler and baker is in how we interpret what goes on in our normal lives, personal events, 
community events, national events, worldwide events can be troubling. The politics and the feelings that these events uh, inspire can really seem to be overwhelming. Remembering that interpretations belong to God can help us to interpret these events in ways that are not so troubling. And firing the baker while restoring the butler is a big part of it. The news cycle, social media, our natural inclinations tend to put the baker in a leadership position. Uh, dramatic events catch our attention. Shiny objects, they excite our emotions, and they send our, our thoughts down paths lined with fears and anxieties. And it's only natural that they would do this. This is how we naturally think. It's very natural to us to watch out for things that might cause trouble and to be anxious about events coming down the road. But thinking this way makes us victims of what happened to the goods in the baker's basket. Our ungoverned emotions attract the birds of misinformation. We gravitate to echo chambers of those who agree with us. We latch on to conspiracy theories, and the resulting polarization arouses outrage in our hearts. And this goes on and on. And once a narrative becomes lodged in our thinking, almost anything that happens can be manipulated to feed and to confirm it. Because nothing is as persuasive as a story. And once we're hooked into a particular story, we can't wait to know what happens next, good or bad. But the Baker's stories aren't peaceful ones. And they do not lead to happy endings. The cycle of anger, criticism, fears, and negativity that they inspire is both divisive and demoralizing. The Lord, however, offers us a different narrative. The Word is the greatest story of all. And in it, a troubled world is led against all odds from a sad place to everlasting happiness by its Savior. And it comes to peace in the end. There are parts of that story that happen day after day in our lives. And when we choose to follow that story and to fit life's facts and events into that narrative, we are allowing interpretations to belong to God. So interpretations belong to God when we believe what is true from the Word and from science and are not distracted by misinformation and appearances. We need to restore the butler. Interpretations belong to God when we do not allow our emotions to be triggered by dramatic events and false narratives, but instead are governed by the laws of love that the Lord teaches. So fire the baker. This is what Joseph knew, and it was the secret to his resilience. And even though the butler forgot his promise to bring Joseph's plate to the attention of Pharaoh, he eventually did remember. And next week in our series, we will hear how Joseph, because of this, became a ruler over all of Egypt. Amen.